Good day and welcome to Double Line's Total Return webcast. Today's call is being recorded. And at this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Ron Riddell, President of Double Line. Please go ahead, sir. Well, thank you and good afternoon and welcome to the Double Line Funds webcast with Jeffrey Gunlock and Andrew Sue. The title of today's webcast, In Our Time. Briefly, uh, if you'd like to see the 2022 webcast schedule, it is now available on DoubleLineFunds.com. Also, our last webcast of the year will be with Ken Shinoda, the portfolio manager of the Double Line Income Fund. That will be on December 14th at uh, 115 Pacific Standard. And then uh, the Just Markets webcast uh, will take place on January 11th with Jeffrey Gunlock. That is a, a widely uh, touted and widely uh, participated in webcasts. So that will be on January 11th. Also like to announce that we have a new YouTube page, uh, a Double Line Funds YouTube page, and you can, you can view that at youtube.com backslash C backslash Double Line Funds. I want to highlight uh, some of the Double Line Media thought leadership. Uh, a lot of our thought leadership is available on YouTube. One of the upcoming uh, thought leadership programs is the Double Line Roundtable Prime Series, and that is uh, featuring uh, Jeffrey Gunlock and other industry titans like Jim Bianco, uh, Daniel Martino Booth, Ed Hyman, and David Rosenberg, and that's moderated by Jeffrey Sherman. That will be available on YouTube in early January, so look out for that. Uh, we also have the Double Lines Channel 11, hosted by uh, Portfolio Manager Ken Shinoda, available on YouTube as well, and you can see uh, the Twitter handle. And the widely acclaimed Sherman Show podcast, also available on YouTube. Both the Sherman Show podcast and the Monday Morning Minutes podcast, where uh, Sam Lau and Jeff Mayberry are participate and host, uh, those are available on DoubleLine.com, iTunes, SoundCloud, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. Today, uh, Mr. Gunlock and uh, Mr. Sue will be discussing the Double Line Total Return Bond Fund. And here you can see the different expense ratios and minimums by our three share classes. I want to highlight the, the standardized performance of the Double Line Total Return Bond Fund. And the fund was launched, it's our oldest fund, uh, open-ended fund. It was launched April 6 of 2010. And through November of this year, the annualized return 5.28% versus the Bloomberg US Aggregate Index of 3.63%, an annualized outperformance of 1.65%. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn the webcast over to Mr. Jeffrey Gunlock. Thank you, Ron, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, Ron talked about how we're going to have the uh, Just Markets webcast coming up January 11th, and I'd just like to uh, remind everybody that that does not discuss any funds that we manage. It's simply Just Markets. That's why that's the title, and we do that so that we are freed of a, the rigid compliance envelopes we have to deal with when we talk about funds like we're doing today. So let me get started here, if I can get this uh, slide to turn, which I tested earlier, let's see if it'll work. There we go, okay. So this is called In Our Time, and I titled this at first because uh, I thought that was happening with markets and the economy and politics and everything else in society, it's, it seems to be accelerating towards that crescendo that I've been talking about for about 15 years we're going to see some very major changes. And it's no longer at some 10 or 15 year future date. I think it's in our time. I also like the name in our time uh, because it's one of my favorite books, one of the first uh, books published by Ernest Hemingway in 1930. It's really a compendium of short stories about the protagonist, Nick Adams, which I think is a stand in for Hemingway himself. And uh, it, it uh, had tremendous acclaim. I have a copy of it here. This is I had, took a course on Hemingway in 1978, which is pretty remarkable, uh, 43 years ago. And that's the book. And uh, there's a chapter in it that I've always remembered, a very, very short, very short uh, preface to a chapter. And I'm going to read it now because I think it's just an incredible insight into the human experience. And it's talking about uh, uh, the Nick Adams, the protagonist at war in Italy in World War I. And he writes, while the bombardment was knocking the trench to pieces at Fosalta, he lay very flat and sweated and prayed, oh, Jesus Christ, get me out of here. Dear Jesus, please get me out. Please, 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 Christ. 
If you only keep me from getting killed, I'll do anything you say. I be I'll believe in you and I'll tell everyone in the world that you are the only one that matters. Please, please. The shelling then moved further up the line. We went to work on the trench and in the morning, the sun came up and the day was hot and muggy and cheerful and quiet. The next night, back at M Mestre, he did not tell the girl he went upstairs with at the Villa Rosa about Jesus, and he never told anybody. So that's an interesting thing about the bargains that people make uh, in the heat of battle and under stress, and uh, oftentimes don't really live up to their promises. We at Double Line try to live up to our promises of uh, risk-adjusted returns that are superior, and uh, we're glad that we're having a very good year this year with our funds broadly outperforming the total return fund up about a percent in a, in a down about a percent bond market. The picture here is also relates to the title. That's Neville Chamberlain, who was the prime minister of England, who negotiated with the Nazis in Germany. And this was him uh, waving the piece of paper where Neville Chamberlain claimed that he had averted the war with Nazi Germany and he had achieved peace in our time was what he said, holding up this ridiculous piece of paper. Obviously that was uh, a little bit like George W. Bush calling it mission accomplished back uh, many years ago in the Gulf War. Uh, so what made me think about the Neville Chamberlain thing uh, in addition to the Hemingway was that it seems that uh, we have a lot of political problems going on geopolitically and uh, we're sort of declared peace in our time in Afghanistan and that didn't work out so well. And hopefully we'll remain peaceful relative to the Ukraine and to Taiwan, but certainly the volume level has been heating up in, in those regards. So let me get started. I don't have as many slides as typically. I'm trying to focus on things that are strike me as highly unusual uh, in our world today, in our time. And I start with the granddaddy of all factors that's been driving particularly risk assets, the blue line on the screen, the light blue line is the S&P 500, and uh, the dark blue line, is uh, the 10-year treasury yield, and then we've got the gray line stepping up, which is quantitative easing. And we've shaded in green quantitative easing. It's one, two, three, and I, now I guess it's four and five. And you'll notice that, interestingly, against people's intuition, the 10-year treasury yield, that dark line, goes up when they're doing quantitative easing. QE1, it went up almost nonstop. QE2, it went up early in the QE, and then relaxed somewhat. QE3, it went up the whole time. Uh, and then here, COVID QE, uh, lo and behold, rates rose. So now that the Fed is uh, talking about tapering and now doubling down and maybe tapering at twice the pace and getting us out by March, weirdly, it would be more, more common for yields actually uh, uh, to be a, a falling during that tapering and that sort of beginning. So you'll notice that the blue line is the stock market, and of course, it's accelerated very mightily uh, thanks to quantitative easing periods. Uh, obviously, aided and abetted by the Fed, here's their balance sheet. Uh, we've seen that's been growing fairly constantly after that huge ramp up uh, in response to the lockdown of the economy. Uh, we saw it resume at a very uh, constant pace of about 120 billion per month. That's dropped by 15 billion in the upcoming month, and Jay Powell has stated that he's likely uh, going to uh, double that pace of tapering to uh, 30, 30 billion, which as I said, would get us out in March. Uh, it's quite likely that since the stock market and risk assets broadly have been clearly supported now for over a decade by balance sheet expansion, uh, it's turning into a little bit rough, rougher waters, I think, for markets as we move into tapering and ultimately raising interest rates. Most uh, participants in the market now believe that Jay Powell has turned more hawkish and is likely to raise interest rates at some point in 2022. Uh, some economists have now gone to a three, right, three hike regime. Now what's been interesting is all the way since for the past, really since I took the Hemingway course just about at Dartmouth back in the late 70s, uh, we've been seeing the economy uh, cave in to stresses at ever lower interest rate levels of uh, treasuries and in particular the Fed funds rate. The last go around in 2018, the Fed funds rate uh, couldn't even make it up really to 3%. And 
and the stock market buckled and went into a bear market in the fourth quarter of 2018, uh, which uh, reversed very quickly as the Fed pivoted, and we went into an even bigger bear market, of course, in response to COVID. I think we're likely to see much more uncertainty and stress as the Fed has now uh, decided to follow the bond market as they typically do, and they turn more hawkish, and Jay Powell will have a section on this in this presentation, has now admitted that transitory uh, is kind of a me meaningless phrase. Uh, he kind of mumbly mouthed it and said that for some unknown reason, people seem to think that using the word transitory meant short term, which I'm guilty of that. Uh, if, if, if everybody else is, I'm guilty of it too. I think that Jay Powell ended up trying to claim that transitory meant no long-term structural problem, but uh, pretty clearly they thought that inflation would be elevated for two or three months, and it's already uh, basically coming on a year and likely to stay elevated based on our work at least until the middle of next year. When I mean elevated, I mean a four-handle at least on headline CPI. There is a risk that there's a seven-handle year-over-year CPI print. It could, have, it could come in the next couple of months. If it's going to come at all, that might be it. But that would really be something to see. I, mo I think most people, uh, if we, it's, at the beginning of 2021, if they were told that uh, there would be a metaphysical certitude that we would see a six-handle CPI at some point in 2021, year-over-year, year, I think very few people would have thought that long-term interest rates, the 30-year treasury I'm talking about, would be virtually unchanged on a year-to-date basis at this time. Uh, it's up about 15 basis points only uh, year-to-date, and that's only thanks to a little bit of a rise uh, today. Uh, it actually had a moment in recent days where it was only up a few basis points from the low, which was hit at the very end of last year. It's very strange how markets, particularly interest rate markets, tend to change direction right at year-end. It's happened way more than should statistically happen during my career, where that the very first day of the year is either the high yield of the year or the low yield of the year. And that's happened again in 2021 for the 30-year Treasury. The, the low yield of the year, at least so far, it's, time's running out, but we're not, and we're not very far above the low of the year, only by 15 basis points. But the low of the year was literally uh, the very first minute of 2021. Now, obviously, the Fed's balance sheet going up has been stimulative. Uh, if you just look at real interest rates using nominal levels, the real interest rate on the Fed funds is uh, negative 614 basis points right now, thanks to the 6.2 CPI. When we say real Fed funds, we're just taking the nominal Fed funds rate, which is basically zero, and subtracting the CPI, which is around 6.2. So you get that negative real interest rate. You'll notice that the negative real interest rate is the highest, the most negative, I should say, at any time in history of this exhibit. And weirdly, it goes back to that Hemingway, Hemingway class that I took, where it was right there in about 1979 or 1980, where we saw the previous most negative real interest rate under Jimmy Carter. So we have, uh, we have lots of things that resemble the late 70s. Unfortunately, one of them is geopolitics, I think. And we also have these uh, inflationary situation this time, we seem to like the inflationary situation better than we did in the 70s. Of course, that's uh, somewhat sensible given all of the debt that's in the economy. The debt clock at debtclock.org has now surpassed $29 trillion, and the unfunded liabilities on the debt clock are back above $160 trillion, which is something like you know, six, 650% of GDP. So we're going to have to deal with these problems in our time, and it seems like it's starting to accelerate into the moment of, of uh, real change happening. Now, that, the, that quantitative easing that we saw, saw in the previous slide with the Fed's balance sheet going up to you know, $9 trillion or so, that has been stimulative. And the Atlanta Fed, I've talked about this in the past, the Atlanta Fed uh, has a study they've been doing for years that says, let's pretend that we didn't do quantitative easing. Let's pretend that the Fed just went negative on Fed funds. What would the Fed funds rate have to have been to create the amount of stimulus that uh, is analyzed to have been created by the zero Fed funds plus the uh, quantitative easing to this great extent? And the study by Wu and Xi at the Atlanta Fed says that it's about 180 basis points or so of incremental stimulus is the quantitative easing. 
So the real Fed funds shadow rate, which is the result of the final Fed's study, is nearly negative 800 basis points, far surpassing the negative interest rates of the Jimmy Carter era. So this has been stimulative, and with the quantitative easing being tapered, we're still stimulating, but it's less. So we're going to start seeing less stimulus to the economy, and rather quickly, if Jay Powell is going to uh, continue to pursue a $30 billion tapering per month, uh, we'll, be, we'll be back to about that negative 6% or so of Fed funds rate uh, it, 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 that uh, we saw without the shadow rate being involved. What's been the, one of the consequences of all of this? Well, of course, it's wildly stimulative economic growth. This is on this is goods spending, and we uh, we take a look at what happened in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, and we saw a very steady growth in cumulative uh, goods spending. It was it rose forty eight percent from the nadir of spending back in early '09 into the pre pandemic. We saw a forty eight percent increase. Interestingly. From the trough in second quarter of 2020 into today, which is only about a year and a half, we have had good spending go up by almost exactly the same amount as that entire 11 or 12 year period. We've gone up 46%. And I think it won't be very long that we surpass goods spending. So this has been tremendously drawn forward. If this, if this chart reminds you of something else, maybe it's this that it reminds you of, which is the ownership, the dollar value, of total U.S. equity ownership by U.S. households, which in 2009 was only $5 trillion, I think, and here it is at six times that level. And so this stimulus by the Fed with very negative interest rates and quantitative easing really retro-rocketed, obviously, the equity market, and that is turning into less of a tailwind at very, very high valuations. We'll be talking about relative valuations in just a minute. One thing that's interesting about all of this total U.S. equity ownership by households and all of this growth in the economy and good spending is sentiment has not really held up very well in recent readings. This is the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Index, which was flying high pre-pandemic, up at 100, and it was actually starting to fall before the pandemic hit. We talked about how that was a recessionary signal in January, February, and March of 2020. And it didn't seem likely that a recession was coming, but weirdly, uh, the sentiment kind of sussed out what was happening uh, with the pandemic building. And we saw the recession actually hit. Look how narrow that shaded red bar is. Obviously, the so-called recession was short-circuited by all of this wild debt. As I pointed out in past webcasts, I don't have a lot of debt slides here today. I've used them plenty of times in the past. As I've talked about, the amount of government debt expansion has been more than the expansion of GDP since the trough of the COVID recession. So in other words, all of economic growth has essentially been debt-based, not just from the government, but also, uh, I'm sure, refinancing of mortgages, which is actually healthy for people if they don't take out equity, but oftentimes they do. But uh, uh, it, it clearly re uh, reduces their propensity to default if they have a lower interest rate level. That's also true of the corporate economy. Much was made of the volume of corporate debt that was issued in 2020, but much a great fraction of it was refinancing. So refinancing of higher uh, interest debt into lower interest debt actually makes corporate balance sheets healthier. And so for all of the corporate debt that exists, uh, we don't see a lot of defaults because the refinancing took over what might, might have been defaults uh, with the effects of the lockdowns and corporate America is actually in better shape than they've been in a very long time. But we see consumer sentiment is, is dipping down into levels that in the past have been associated with recession. It's not there yet, but it's falling pretty rapidly. And what's driving this drop in sentiment are two areas that have been so hot, and so it's sensible that consumers are a little bit more pessimistic about the forward-looking view. One of them on the screen now is autos. Ask a question, is this a good time to buy a car? And we have the lowest readings of all time. It's weird how this correlates to the, low, to the negative interest rates. In our time, we're, see, we're seeing things happen that haven't happened in 40 or 50 years. We've seen the negative interest rates I've talked about. We see uh, auto sentiment is just as bad as it was 
back in 1980. This time it's not for the same reason. Around 1980, sentiment for autos was very low because interest rates were totally unaffordable with short-term money at about 20% and mortgage rates up in the teens and so on. This time it's just that we had all of this money spraying by the federal government creating outrageous demand and also uh, a, a shunning of public transportation with a contagious uh, pandemic. And so auto prices just through the roof, and now we have the lowest readings ever, and this is a good time to buy a car. This is another thing that will probably be slowing down the economy as we enter into 2022, because autos are obviously a long-term purchase, and durable goods uh, are by definition long-term purchases. They include autos, and this has been pulled forward. And so one could expect not only uh, economic headwind based upon sentiment drags, but also from the fact that the purchases have already been made. The same thing has been true for another category, which is red hot, which is housing. Is it a good time to buy a house on the University of Michigan sentiment? And it's not quite as bad as 1980 in this case, but it's in the same territory. So again, the same as the Jimmy Carter era, and it's obviously because home prices have gone up so much. So again, in 1980, it was perceived to be a bad time to buy a house because interest rates were so unaffordable. Now interest rates are wickedly affordable, the most affordable of all time, because the inflation rate is well above the uh, interest rate on, on, a, on a mortgage, particularly the inflation rate on housing. In fact, we'll get to that in a minute, but the inflation rate on housing is really off the charts and is leads to our conclusion at Double Line that the CPI may stay elevated because the effects of owner's equivalent rent need to percolate through the CPI data in 2022. Uh, it does so with a lag. The methodology that the government uses, I don't think is very robust. I don't think it's very good, but it leads to a lag factor on housing inflation. So the inflation on autos may go away. The inflation uh, on you know lumber may dissipate. Uh, the inflation on some of the supply chain bottlenecks may dissipate, but wage growth and uh, and shelter, as it's captured in the CPI, may replace it and keep uh, inflation elevated. Our model at Double Line shows uh, that looking out to the end of 2022, it's very possible that we don't see a reading that has a handle below four at any time in 2022, which makes interest rates at basically uh, one and a half percent ish uh, or less on treasuries look extraordinarily overvalued. So that's what's dragging down the economy and may lead to a drag on the economy further with the uh, Fed uh, starting to get hawkish and the constantly they're going to raise interest rates. I believe the pattern of the past 40 years of the economy buckling under ever lower interest rate hiking regimes, in other words, that the interest rate doesn't have to rise as much as it did years ago, I think that pattern is going to continue. So it's likely that we will see economic problems with just a few rate hikes from the Fed, maybe only four rate hikes or so. Maybe it's one or one and a half on the Fed funds rate that breaks the economy. And as we see what's going on in the bond market, which is very negative yields and an ever flat yield curve, which we'll get to in a moment uh, since March of this year, uh, the bond market seems to be sniffing out a weaker economy coming. And the curve is flattening at a sufficient clip that one should expect um, uh, economic problems sooner rather than later. I, I've, uh, my base case is we'll start to see trouble uh, in, by the second half of 2022. Now, uh, back to work is interesting. Another thing that's factoring in, into sentiment and the changes in our time is the way in which people work. Um, very many firms are going to a hybrid model of back to work. Here in Southern California, we have some of the more, more stringent policies, and we were going to have more of a back to work in January, and we still might. But it depends, of course, on how this latest variant ends up uh, ends up developing. It's kind of fascinating how the uh, back to work turnstiles in Manhattan. So this isn't for the country as a whole. This is for major population center. Of Manhattan, and I feel like it's the same largely in other major population centers. This is the turnstile entries uh, in Manhattan, and we can see that they're still down 60% from where they were pre pandemic. So, lots of changes coming in the way people work. Another manifestation of changes in workplace habits 
are the great resignation, as it's being called, where many job seekers have been surveyed as saying they want to switch careers, not just jobs, but careers. I saw a survey about a month ago, and if, I, if memory serves, it was 58% of those responding said they're seriously contemplating a change in their career. But uh, this is the flip side now of, of, of the housing and the autos. This is a good time to buy a house and autos? No, is the survey result. Is now a good time to find a quality job? Well, we're off the charts. I don't know if this survey existed before 2020, 2002, but since that time, over the past 20 years or so, we've never seen people say this is a better time. There's, uh, there's been a better time to find a quality job. And one thing that uh, I think captures that is the next slide, and this is, here it is, this is the uh, NFIB Jobs Hard to Fill, which is uh, the black line, the dark blue line, and it's overlaid against the Small Business Compensation Plans Index. So not surprisingly, when openings are hard to fill, you've, that's correlated with worker compensation plans uh, being increased, and we see very high uh, for index reading on worker compensation plans. And I don't think double line is alone at feeling like we need to uh, pay our employees more because of the risk of the great resignation. Fortunately, at double line, we have very low turnover by uh, investment industry standards and we, we continue to. But I do think that people are uh, having lifestyle shifts in our time as they deal with the different ways in which society has to organize itself as this pandemic is now really two years old, uh, at least two years old. I think the cases that were initially reported in China were more than two years ago now. Now, one thing that's interesting about this with these worker compensation plans going up, this is a slide I've used before. I find it fascinating. It's really all low age workers. This is the Atlanta Fed growth, wage growth tracker by age and the lowest cohort is that purple line on top and that's ages 16 to 24. So these are entry level jobs, probably baristas and bartenders and waiters and, and you know, uh, people who work fast food restaurants and the like. And we see that we have the highest wage growth in over 10 years, or 15 years really, on that cohort. And it's gone straight up since the, the, uh, since the pandemic. Interestingly, all the other cohorts, and I think, I think that one's mislabeled. It says age 22 to 54. I really think it's 25 to 54. But at any rate, the other cohorts that are older than 24 years old there has not been much acceleration in wage growth. In fact, it continued to decline. It was growing, but at a gently declining rate post-pandemic. And just now we're starting to see it go up. And we've been watching this carefully. The last time I used this slide, we did not see these upticks in the overall rate or the 22 and older crowd, and certainly not in the 55 and older crowd. And we're starting to see it. And I don't think this is a coincidence. I, I think the wage growth of the entry-level jobs is going to start pushing into wage growth at higher levels. I saw a sign at a Denny's, I think it was, where it said, uh, now hiring, of course, all shifts, all locations, full-time, part-time. And it said, entry-level, uh, unskilled, $16 an hour. And on, below that on the sign, it said, uh, supervisory jobs, $16.50 an hour. And I almost like had to drive off the park on the side of the road. I was so so flabbergasted by this, that the gap could be so small. And it made me realize that probably that higher wage for the entry-level job would, would bleed into higher wages as you move up the ladder. And I think that's happening uh, here. And we're starting to see it even the 55 and older. So I do think that some of the goods inflation uh, that was so prevalent here in 2021, that may ease. But I do think wage inflation is starting to increase. And I do think that uh, for sure, shelter inflation, we'll get to that in a second. Just talk about equities for, for a moment. I'm really gonna talk about the attractiveness on a valuation basis of emerging market equity. This slide shows the outrageous outperformance of, of the US versus the rest of the world. So what we have here is the red line, which is the price of the S&P 500 divided by the MSCI World Index. And this goes back to 2006. Let's just look at the last 10 years where it went from 0.8 to nearly two. So more than a doubling of the performance, but about 150% of performance of the US versus the rest of the world. And the, the whole thing that's really underperformed is emerging markets. 
Uh, the blue line is the PE uh, comparison. So it's the it's it's the uh, it's the uh, U.S. Uh, compared to the rest of the world PE. And of course, the blue line being down means the U.S. is really expensive versus the rest of the world. Of course, it hasn't been this expensive and it's gotten way more expensive in the past couple of years. Thanks primarily, I think, to the, the, to the very direct money giveaways in the United States translating into tremendous profitability, uh, although uh, the PE has grown e even more uh, than just that uh, profitability gap. So let's take a look at the emerging markets. And here we have uh, the S&P 500 just divided by a subset of the rest of the world, the emerging markets. And look at the, look at the uh, outperformance of the S&P 500 uh, this year, basically, where we see that emerging markets have underperformed. It's got the index, the comparison here is the S&P divided by MSCI emerging markets. And we see that it's gone from below seven to up to uh, nine and a half recently was the peak. And uh, there hasn't been much of a correction along the way. So this is a very, very strong outperformance. S&P is up a lot and emerging markets are down a lot. There's about a 40 point difference. And some emerging markets, it's a 50 point difference. So S&P might be up 25 and the emerging market might be down 25. Some are even down 40. So, we, so that's clearly due to economic outcomes and the problems of healthcare systems and uh, the pandemic problems in many of the emerging markets. Uh, so th that uh, has also been due somewhat to the dollar, which has strengthened particularly against emerging market currencies. Here's a comparison just using the Dixie index, which is the, the black line, and the Bloomberg US dollar index, which is virtually the same, that's the red line. And then we see US dollar divided by EM. Uh, and so we see just how uh, that blue line is the U.S. dollar outperforming emerging market currencies, and that's uh, really accelerated very recently. Obviously, this just is not uh, does not look like a top in that blue line. It looks like it has a lot of momentum, and it may go further. But we're on watch for seeing the dollar reverse. I've been talking about how the dollar would likely be strong in the second half of 2021. I said said that in every webcast this year and last year we expected the dollar to have a good year in 2021, particularly in the second half, and that's happened. My long-term view remains strongly dollar bearish. So a lot of people don't listen quite carefully and specifically, and they hear me say that I'm long-term dollar bearish, and then they turn around and say, you've been wrong on the dollar. No, I haven't. I've been right. I've been spot on on the dollar this year. I said it would be strong in the second half. I think we're looking at a weak dollar as we look forward uh, to call it uh, second half of next year, maybe maybe 2023, but the dollar is going to go down thanks to the twin deficit problem in the United States. I've included that slide repeatedly in webcasts. I don't have it in this deck, but the dollar has made it 297 on the Dixie index, and it looks like it's starting to stall out. 97 was something of a target. You'll notice that black line, the Dixie index. We expect it would get up into that congestion zone of 2018, or 2019 rather, and uh, start to run into resistance there. And that appears to be starting. When the dollar starts to go down, you're going to see tremendous outperformance by non-US stocks, kind of some of, of the reversal of the slides we saw uh, in, in, in a, a few slides ago. Emerging markets will be a very strong performer when that happens. We do not own emerging market equity right now. We have not bought emerging market equity. We still think it's too early. We do own some European equity. That worked just fine until a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and now the uh, European has started to underperform again. Uh, but we're continuing to hold, as a structural hold, some European equities, uh, which we bought for the first time in 12 years uh, several months ago. Here's just the long-term view of the, of the Dixie Index. Uh, we see that it had bottomed out on that horizontal line. Uh, we expected that would happen, and we see that the rally that's happened. But notice the long-term trend of the dollar, which began really back in 1985, when the dollar was at its highest level. Ever since then, we've seen the dollar being in a broad declining mode for the past nearly 40 years. And we see that we see declining highs and lower lows. We think that pattern will continue. Uh, in the near term, we've been bullish, but we think that when we break down below that horizontal line, we think it's going to start accelerating lower, and that would be the buy signal. So one doesn't have to be anticipatory and try to 
to be a genius and try to pick the high tick. I think you let the market do the talking because when the dollar starts to slip, I think it's going to slip uh, pretty mightily and take out that low of 2009, which, which, which was down there at about 70.7 or so. So that would be quite a drop from here and lead to strong translation for dollar-based investors if they invest in, in foreign currencies. So that's, that's a theme that we'll be developing, I'm sure, in the Just Market webcast as well. Here's uh, S&P long-term versus emerging markets. Uh, and it's really fairly incredible. See, the last time we had valuation like this was really in the run-up of the dot-com situation. And it's very fascinating to see charts that compare the dot-com era to some of the uh, speculative froth today, like some of these funds that invest in very go-go companies, uh, basically had the same run-up as dot-coms did in the late 90s, and now, are, and now have clearly rolled over and are showing the magnitude of decline that the dot-coms had in the aftermath of the dot-com bust. So uh, this emerging market thing versus the S&P looks kind of the same. We're not quite there at the peak, uh, the, the double top of the 90s and early 00s, but we're in the same context. So on a valuation basis, I, I think it's early. Again, I wouldn't execute the trade today, but this is remarkable how much emerging markets have been able to outperform U.S. stocks when the time is right. Just look at how much the emerging market, it was a full round trip. All of the outperformance of the middle of the 90s was completely reversed over the next, over the ensuing, say, uh, six or eight years after the dot-com bust. That could very well happen again. I don't have the CAPE ratios in the deck this time, but the CAPE ratio of emerging markets is less than half of the CAPE ratio of the S&P 500. And it has, in the past, had times when it was higher than the S&P 500's CAPE ratio. This is also an interesting thing for the Emerging Market Currency Index. This is the JP Morgan Emerging Market Currency Index. And you'll just see how low it is. I haven't come down once again, and it's double bottoming here and may exhibit a throwover, which would be that gray horizontal area if we were actually go to a new low, which I, I think maybe we are right now, but then reject that new low and bounce back above. That's what we'd be waiting for for an early warning sign that perhaps this trend is changing. But uh, this has been a, a mighty underperformance. Uh, the trend is always your friend, but we're looking for major opportunities. And this could very well be one as we look forward two or three years as an investment horizon. Let's talk about inflation. Here's a global inflation surprise index. The, the constituents are various countries. You notice that they're all surprising to the upside. There isn't a single observation on this display that is below zero. So it's a global phenomenon. Here's the CPI contributors in the United States. Um, it's interesting uh, how uh, the, the core services was negative for a while, and now it's joined on the upside, that yellow shaded area. Uh, we can see that energy is contributing. Just about everything's contributing except food, which feels to me uh, like it's being underreported. It feels to me that food is contributing more to the CPI but perhaps that's a methodology thing. I would say maybe food prices could be another uh, engine that uh, keeps the CPI from going anywhere close to where it was pre-pandemic. Remember when they couldn't get the CPI to get to 2%, and now uh, I think they'd be happy. They think it's low inflation now if it went to 3%. Also, it's fairly, fairly broad-based. Here's an exhibit I've never used before. This is the percent of the CPI basket, which is about 200 different items with prices increases of greater than 4% year over year. And this goes back to 1990, and it's basically the highest readings, about 45%. So something like 90 out of 200 uh, components are uh, basically uh, rising at greater than 4%. And this sure looks like a powerful trend. So we've been hawkish on inflation at double line. We did not, we were not hawkish enough. We did not anticipate a six handle this year, even though we had one of the highest forecasts in the industry, we did not have six. And now we actually think there is a shot at, at getting a seven in the, in the very near term. Here's another uh, measure of inflation that tries to throw out some of the outliers, some of the, the tails. This is the 16% Cleveland Fed trimmed mean CPI, it basically takes out the 8% lowest ones and 8% highest ones and leaves us with the other 84%. And it really is striking, isn't it? How it's just somebody rang a bell and it went straight up 
uh, in just a few months from a 2% level to a 4% level. And just like uh, I wouldn't try to be a genius and call a top on emerging markets uh, versus the S&P to the day, I don't really think that one would be wise to say that this is a top. Here's um, a PCE, another inflation measure. Uh, one that had been lagging others. I don't usually include this, but I just want to point out how we just saw the highest print uh, in, in recent uh, memory uh, for the for the month over month at 6.3. Of course, that would annualize to about an eight percent number. Uh, we also see the core index has woken up a little bit out of its slumber and went up about uh, 0.43. So that's also rising at about five percent. Here's another uh, inflation measure that we have talked about in the past, the PPI. Uh, it's been uh, averaging, it's been uh, over 0.5 every month here in uh, 2021. So many months in a row, uh, it's averaged by about 0.8. So we're seeing PPI, they slice and dice in a variety of ways. On this exhibit, we're using final demand and the year over year is 8.6. There are other ways of looking at it where it's running in the double digits. And so this actually re-accelerated in the most recent month when it looked like maybe it was starting to decelerate. Here's that uh, shelter inflation that I wanna talk about again. I think this is one of the key issues. We see core services and shelter inflation. Services is 58% of, uh, of CPI and shelter is about a third of CPI. So shelter can plug a pretty big hole uh, if it really starts to move up. We've noticed that shelter inflation has gone up as reported by the government. Uh, that's the uh, blue line. It's gone up to three and a half, but obviously home inflation is way above three and a half percent. How much above is it? Well, let's take a look. First of all, uh, this seems to be a little bit out of order. I, I, I ordered these, so it's my fault, but it, this is existing home sales monthly supply, which hit an all-time low of 1.9 months uh, back uh, late last year, early this year. And it's still at one of the lowest levels in history at only 2.4 months. In fact, it actually dipped in the most recent month, which uh, came a little bit of a surprise because rates were a little bit higher, maybe last minute buyers trying to get in front of what they thought might be higher interest rates uh, that really haven't developed very much. Uh, now we've seen lower rates in recent period, but here's existing home sales median price year over year. And it got as high as almost 24% uh, earlier this year but it's still extremely elevated at 13% year over year. So we have uh, owner's equivalent rent and the shelter component, which is a little bit broader than owner's equivalent rent going up 3.5%. And yet existing home sale median prices are up by double digits over 13% still. And they've been living at 13% or higher for many months now. We also have the Case-Shiller Index of home prices which is basically the highest in 20 years. It came off slightly from 20% to 19%, but this is running far, far above the so-called 3.1 owner's equivalent rent, 3.5 shelter. Here's uh, another measure of simply rent. This is uh, vacancies, which is the red line, and the purple line is uh, median rent nationwide. And vacancies were running along at 6 to 7% in 2019, then the pandemic came, and we see vacancies go way down. Vacancies went from 7% down to about 4% presently. And right when they crossed over somewhere around vacancies of 5.5% or so and dipped below there, we saw the apartment list uh, national median rent start to move higher very steadily. And now it's risen by well into the double digits, non-annualized. Just over the past eight months or so, we have a double digit increase in nationwide median rent. So that's going to have to filter into the shelter of the CPI. And since it's such a big component of the CPI, it's so understated versus the actual index uh, and observed realities, it could easily add a percent to the CPI and plug a hole of something else uh, dipping down, like some of the uh, supply chain issues. Here's a uh, just apartmentless medium meeting around, just noticing the trend, there's seasonality in the in this thing. We brought this back to 2018, and there's this kind of year-end dip seasonality, and there's uh, stronger rent increases in the summer months. This time, uh, they're really we haven't seen the seasonality. In fact, we're just seeing we're seeing the, 
the, the trend continue. And so one, one should expect to see uh, higher rents continuing through the middle of next year, even accelerating. So I did this thought experiment last webcast. I'm just repeating it. What if we used, uh, what, what if we used uh, home prices as opposed to the shelter construct in the CPI? What would the CPI be? Well, it wouldn't be 6.2, it would be 12.3. Now, of course, this is simplistic and maybe hyperbolic, but it sh kind of shows the extent to which inflation could be stickier. And, and Jay, Jay Powell himself has given up on this concept of, of even trying to term it anything other than inflation in our time. Let's look at yields, and then, then I'll turn it over to Andrew, and we'll be back for Q&A. Here we see the 12-month uh, Treasury yield, which was completely somnolent back there uh, post-pandemic, and now it's starting to go up. This is in anticipation of the Fed. I don't really know why we have the Fed. Why don't we just look at these charts? Because the Fed turns hawkish when the left panel starts to go up, when the market starts to anticipate uh, higher short-term rates, one-year rates, Moving forward, the Fed pays attention and starts to adjust its rhetoric, which happened to a fairly large extent most recent, at the most recent meeting where we dropped transitory and we got fairly hawkish with the doubling down on the tapering. The two-year Treasury yield also anticipates what the Fed is doing. That started to rise way back uh, in the first quarter of this year. It was down at 10 basis points. Now it's up at, in the 60s. Uh, the two-year Treasury yield is now at the high of the year today. It's the high of the year. The three-year Treasury yield is less than a basis point below its high of the year. So short rates are on the move. Uh, that's not going to be positive for uh, the economy. I th don't think it's enough yet to be that debilitating. But again, I, th I think if we get these rates up above one, I, I think the economy is fra sufficiently fragile that it might uh, run into problems has has been the pattern for 40 years at ever lower interest rate levels as the cycles uh, go forward. Here's the yield curve. A lot of lines on here. Let's just look at the uh, orange line. That's the two-year Treasury yield uh, versus the 30-year Treasury yield. It was as high as 225 basis points earlier this year. Just about everybody and their brother was looking for a, a steeper yield curve. We at Double Line were from the outset of the pandemic into March of this year, and then we observed how offsides or one-sided positioning was on curve steepening, we turned neutral. Uh, we didn't turn into a flattener the way we probably should have, but we at least no longer looked for a, a steepener back in March of this year. Now we've seen, we saw first a, a correction of the steepener, and now I think you just have to call it a flattener. We've gone from 225 basis points, twos to 30s, and now we're down at basically 100 today, very close to 100. So it's, it's half the way to flat from where we were in March, and the trend is definitely in place here. The bond market seems to be sussing out economic trouble. And I will once again say, as I've said, every time that the yield curve is flattened in my career, I turn on the TV and I hear people saying, it doesn't matter this time that the curve is flattening. There's other factors. And one of the adjuncts to that recently, in recent cycles, has been, well, yeah, the curve's flat, but it's flat at such low rates that it doesn't really mean anything. Actually, it's the opposite. For the curve to flatten at such low rates is sending double the signal than it flattening at high rates, in my view. Um, because who the heck wants to buy negative real yields of 600, 400 basis points or 600 basis points using the shadow rate uh, for 30 years? Uh, you, you have to believe that there's going to be economic trouble to want to buy negative yields of that magnitude when you can buy negative yields of perhaps, if we go inverted, of even less magnitude of negative yields by staying defensive at the short end. So we're going to be watching that. This is clearly trending in a way that is not suggesting stronger economic growth building in 2022, rather the opposite. Here is our old friend Copper Gold. This worked great until the pandemic. Uh, it was one of the best indicators. You notice that this goes back to 2017. We use different time windows. We're choosing this four-year or five-year window for this exhibit. And you see the red line is the 10-year Treasury yield, and the blue line is the copper-gold ratio. Worked really well until the Fed started manipulating interest. I said in past calls that appeared to me the Fed was defending the 2% level on a 30-year Treasury. And so I recommended in my most recent webcast or two that 
as unattractive as it looks fundamentally, if the 30 year treasury would get to 2%, it was something of a buy uh, because the Fed seems to be defending it. And so we see that in the copper gold ratio, it says that the 10 year treasury should be at least 100 basis points higher than it is today. We have other metrics that we use that suggest the same types of things, but our old friend copper gold has broken down. And uh, we did extend duration a little bit in the total return fund uh, using the thought that the Fed was defending interest rates and as fundamentally unattractive as bonds were, we liked the long bond at 2%. We talked about it repeatedly. Last slide for me, and then on to Andrew for the fund. And then I'll uh, use the, that time to uh, go through the questions and I'll answer uh, five or six questions that seem to capture. When I look at, there's always hundreds and hundreds of questions in these queues. Many of them are repetitive. What I'll try to do is hit the high points that seem that the audience seems to be most interested in. The last slide, this is also uh, something of a warning sign. It's reversed in recent days, but the high yield market was starting to slump. This is, uh, this is the market uh, high yield index, and we saw that it went from a price of a 110 and a half down to 107 and a half, which is meaningful because we saw, you know, we haven't exactly had a lot of movement to the upside in treasury rates. So this, this movement, uh, it represented widening of spreads and widening of spreads uh, in the high yield market is always something to watch out for. Uh, not exactly a catastrophe, uh, re retracing only a fraction of the price gain going back uh, uh, to the uh, uh, middle of 2020. But I would advise investors to keep their eyes on this high yield market because it's been reliably the canary in the coal mine for risk assets broadly. With that, Andrew, I'm going to pass the baton to you and uh, go through some of the facts and the fundamentals underneath the uh, total return bond fund. Thanks a lot, Jeffrey. Um, so we're gonna handle this a little bit differently uh, this time. We're gonna talk about the fund first and then talk about some of the fundamentals and the subsectors driving the performance for the total return bond fund. So first off, we'll, let's take a look at the portfolio metrics here. Uh, we'll sort of start off by looking at the duration. The duration of the portfolio is positioned at 4.5 years as of November 26th. And it is about two and a quarter years short of uh, the index. And we are uh, deliberately positioning this way to have lower interest rate volatility uh, as we've seen a lot of uh, volatility with interest rates uh, as of late. Now, uh, one other uh, fact to, to point out here is just looking at the uh, average dollar price. So we're looking at average dollar price of the underlying bonds for the total return bond fund versus the constituents in the index. And you can see that the fund does have a lower uh, bond price and that does put us in a better uh, convexity or gives us a better convexity profile versus that of the index. So we do think that with both duration and convexity uh, position where they are, it does set us up well to end this year and into uh, and, and go into 2022. Um, looking next at this chart, this is a chart that we cover often, um, and I'll, I'll just kind of cover it real quickly. The blue line here uh, depicts the duration of the total return bond fund over time. And then the red line here shows the yield on the 10-year Treasury bond uh, over the same time period. Now, uh, we have been very active in duration positioning in 2021. Uh, as Jeffrey mentioned, we did use Treasuries to extend duration during the first quarter. Uh, and the expectation there was really a retracement of yields. Uh, and we did see this subsequently in the second quarter. And then uh, more recently, we started using AB, uh, agency CMBS uh, more fulsomely uh, during this fourth quarter to manage duration uh, as we've seen the aggregate index extend to the longest point it has ever been. Uh, in terms of uh, portfolio composition, uh, we've increased our exposure to government guaranteed assets uh, over this fourth quarter. Approximately 55% of the por total portfolio is uh, in government guaranteed assets. This would be the U.S. Treasuries, the agency pass-throughs, uh, agency uh, CMOs, and then also the agency CMBS. Uh, the balance of the portfolio is in credit assets, and we do use exclusively structure, uh, structured credit. Uh, the largest component here will be in the mortgage space, not agency mortgage-backed securities. Uh, but then we have been increasing our exposure uh, in several other areas, and that includes uh, non-agency CMBS. So that's non-government guaranteed CMBS, uh, CLOs, and also asset-backed securities. Let's see. So moving on and uh, looking at some fundamentals here, uh, Jeffrey did allude to how strong the housing market is. And we do often get questions from our clients about uh, the strength of the housing market and if there's a correction, if we would see something like 2008. 
Uh, and the answer is no. And this chart can explain it just by really looking at the green portion of the graph. If you look uh, before 2008, uh, the green portion, which represents prime borrowers, uh, these are the borrowers that are uh, have pristine uh, uh, credit scores. Uh, they were a smaller portion of the overall mortgage origination prior to 2008. Uh, we all know what happened in 2008, but if you look at the mortgage origination and the credit quality that's being originated now, uh, the vast majority of the origination process is in the green portion. So if there is an economic pullback, uh, we do feel that this cohort, the prime borrower, uh, can essentially uh, withstand the headwinds or the stress uh, of an economic pullback. Uh, certainly, there may be some adjustment in pricing uh, for the underlying homes, but we do not see a scenario where we'd see widespread defaults and delinquencies uh, such as uh, we did in 2008. The, the backdrop in the landscape is so much different this time around. Uh, transitioning over into the consumer markets, here we're looking at several different consumer sectors. Uh, we're looking at uh, student loans, uh, mortgages, credit cards, and also autos. Uh, the one thing they share in common is that in terms of delinquencies, and this is anything that's 90 days or more delinquent, uh, they're all seeing all-time lows in terms of delinquencies. And uh, this is a factor of the, the strength of the consumer coming into the pandemic. They had high savings, uh, low leverage at that point in time. Uh, but then also you did have a uh, record amount of uh, stimulus injected into the market, and much of this found their way its way into the balance sheet of these consumers. So the consumers were flush with cash. They're, they're able to meet their financial obligations, but stimulus has run out, uh, largely speaking. Uh, most stimulus programs have wound up. Uh, those who, that haven't, they will wind up soon. So what is going to happen here in terms of delinquencies? And our view is that there will be a reversion towards the mean. It will not be a sharp uh, uh, reversion. Uh, and the reason for, for the lack of a sharp reversion is just because the consumer continues to have a very strong balance sheet. They have high savings um, and, and relatively low leverage. So we don't see a sharp uh, uh, reversal here, but we do expect a mean reversion as the markets normalize. Uh, maybe one other thing to touch on here uh, is that black line. A lot of people ask a question about the black line and how come student loans, and that's what the black line is, drop so so uh, so steeply there? Student loans have a uh, deferment option, and that's that's kind of unique to student loans. But essentially, what those student loan uh, borrowers did is they essentially deferred their payments. The payments will resume in February of 2022 uh, for the federally funded student loans. It will be interesting to see how those borrowers behave, but we will be watching that quite closely here. Uh, looking at the resilience of structured finance, um, I, I will talk about this slide, but one other thing I wanted to touch on was uh, Jeffrey did talk about inflation uh, at length. And I would say this is that if you look at CPI data and break down the underlying components, uh, two of the sectors that see the highest amount of inflation is lodging and also durable goods. And it just happens that a lot of these types of assets, lodging and durable goods type assets, find their way into securitized products. So what you have in this instance is you have high inflation in areas where uh, we are securitizing these assets. And what that's going to do is that's going to increase the asset value or, or the secured asset that you have in your investment here. At the same time, we also have a structure where it's naturally amortizing, meaning you're paying principal and interest on a monthly basis. And what that leads to is it leads to a uh, low or, or better, more attractive uh, loan to value ratio over time. So that's definitely uh, something that structured finance has going for it in this high inflationary environment, whereas many assets uh, may not have that, that benefit. Now, on this slide, what we're looking at is really credit enhancement, which is uh, depicted with the blue bars here, uh, versus serious delinquencies. And serious delinquencies is anything that's 60 days or more delinquent. And what we're comparing is, is uh, the amount of delinquencies versus the amount of protection or credit enhancement that you have. Uh, you would have to erode all your credit enhancement in order to see $1 principal loss. And you can see, by and large, every single sector here has more credit enhancement than there are delinquencies. Now, the one sector, and I pointed this out last quarter, that it appears that doesn't have that ratio or that benefit is legacy non-agency mortgage-backed securities, the one thing I would say here is you have to look at the average dollar price. The average dollar price is 78, which means you have a 22 uh, point discount to par. If you add that 22 points to the blue portion or the credit enhancement, what you have is significantly more credit enhancement than delinquency. So we are in a position with our credit assets where we have significant protection 
uh, in the form of credit enhancement. But uh, don't forget, inflation uh, may actually benefit some of our investments as well. Um, looking at uh, consumers again, uh, this, this chart we put in just because it's quite interesting. Uh, Autos, whether it's new or used cars, uh, they've been extremely in demand. And what we're seeing is extremely low delinquencies and defaults within the auto space. Uh, again, the consumer has a very strong balance sheet, so they are in a strong financial position. But even if they were to encounter financial difficulties, uh, rising asset prices in these vehicles allows them or gives them the option to essentially uh, sell the vehicle and essentially have more value than their loan. We did not see this phenomenon in 2008, and because of that reason, you are seeing very, very attractive uh, or very low delinquency and default figures across many areas of uh, consumer assets, including autos here. Uh, finally, we're going to talk about the commercial real estate market, and here we're looking at uh, CMBS delinquencies over time by sector. And you can see that uh, during the pandemic, there was a sharp spike in delinquencies, and uh, you don't need me to explain why that was, but what we do see is that those sectors that were hit the hardest, the subsectors in CMBS that were hit the hardest, they rebounded uh, the most uh, most steeply during during this this um, recovery phase. And what this chart does not show is the rise in price of CMBS assets. So what we have seen during this recovery period is uh, a very pronounced recovery in CMBS pricing, and we have used this recovery to reposition some of our portfolio. Uh, one example is really moving out of uh, very high priced hospitality assets or hotel assets uh, into and repositioning into uh, asset classes or subsectors that have less sensitivity to market vol volatility. That could be industrial, that could be multifamily. So we are using this opportunity to reshift the portfolio into uh, more protected asset classes, especially since uh, prices rose so much and we do have the ability to harvest some gains. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand it back to Jeffrey to cover some of the questions from our listeners. Uh, thank you very much. All right. All right. Thanks, Andrew. So uh, per usual, I always get a lot of questions about gold, and I didn't include the, this time, uh, largely because it's so boring. Uh, gold has been shockingly stable with all of the commodity inflation and uh, the wild ride that's been going on in Bitcoin which interestingly, Bitcoin still is lower than it was in April, even though it had such a huge run into April. Uh, gold uh, is alone, gold and silver with it are kind of the or orphans in the commodity market. They've not gone up at all and have actually gone down, silver in particular, year to date. I think you need for gold to reaccelerate to the upside, you need the dollar to roll over. I think the dollar being firm year to date this year uh, has uh, been a cap on gold, and uh, but I do think that when the dollar heads down, gold will go up. So I, I, I personally uh, continue to own gold, though I haven't bought any uh, in really, the last time I bought gold was in the September of 2012, uh, sorry, 2018, when it was uh, at 1180 or so. So I like gold as a long-term hold, but it certainly has not been rewarding at all this year compared to other things in commodities. Uh, speaking of commodities, somebody asked, is there an easy way for a retail investor to invest in commodities? Well, DoubleLine has a commodity fund, uh, DBCRX, I believe it is, if I've got it right. Uh, and a commodity, but it's just called DoubleLine Commodity. You can look up what the ticker is. And uh, I'm not sure it's the greatest time to buy commodities uh, because they've been up so much but uh, certainly there's ways to do it through, through mutual funds and Double Line does have one. Somebody asks, and this is a good question, I think this is one of the key questions, from a policy perspective, do I think the Fed will step in if the equity market declines by say 20% or more? Well, certainly that's been the case. Um, and I don't think that's a, it's good to bet against that. The Fed clearly has responded to movements in markets. I'd say at, an, at increasing rates, uh, as the years have worn on here. And so I do think the Fed will defend uh, risk assets through probably more money printing. Money printing and, and money giveaways, I think are with us to stay as part of this fourth turning that I've been talking about. I've, I predicted this years ago that we would, we would send money to people and do it uh, more broadly and at greater amounts. So when George W. Bush did a few hundred dollars uh, that didn't move the needle very much. That was during the global financial crisis. 
That was hundreds of dollars. Now it's thousands of dollars, in some cases, tens of thousands of dollars. So the trend is to add zeros to this, this type of money printing. And the difference between now and 40 years ago, the Jimmy Carter era, is we didn't want inflation. We had felt the ravages of inflation and we didn't want it. We, we, we suffered through uh, the, the courage of, of Paul Volcker, who got rid of inflation. This time we seem to want inflation. And there's a reason to want it, and that's all the debt that we have that we need to devalue one way or devalue or default one way or the other. And so the money printing mechanism, I think, is with us. Another good question from the same person, actually: Can the U.S. rates exceed two percent if Europe and Japan stay with zero or negative interest rates? And I think that's a really good point. That's one of the fundamental reasons, in addition to the Fed. Uh, I think that the, the, the bond market actually gets attractive at the 2% sort of a level on long-term rates. It's because hedged into dollars, so if European investors hedge into dollars or Japanese investors hedge into dollars, so they're not taking currency risk by buying U.S. bonds, they still pick up significant yield over their negative interest rates. And I think that has been a driver of uh, capping rates. And I also think it's been helping the dollar remain strong. This is one of my the fundamental thesis for the second half of 2021 was that investors typically, foreign investors, start to curtail their hedging if the dollar uh, is trending in a way that's neutral or favorable to them owning U.S. bonds and getting a higher yield because if they, you know, hedging costs money. So I, I do think that that's that, that's a variable there. Some of the, some questions about the mainstream media. Somebody asked, are they are they finally becoming less biased? I don't know if they're becoming less biased or not. I think at some point you have to admit reality. It's sort of like Jay Powell talking about, you know, retiring the word transitory uh, and, and starting to follow the market. At some point, you just have to realize that your narratives are no longer in sync with reality. And I think that's happened to a certain extent in the mainstream media. I think the Afghanistan debacle, uh, you know, trying to shift the idea that everybody wanted to leave Afghanistan. Of course, that's true but it's how you do it that was so egregiously mishandled. And I think that kind of sort of broke a little bit of the, uh, the mentality of, of the media. Comment, uh, people ask about def deflation. What about, you know, maybe there's secular deflation and it's just short-term cyclical inflation. Uh, I think that would be something to really think deeply about if it weren't for the government's desire to have inflation. I think secular deflation will, should, should the debt burden hit economic circumstances that tip things over into a, a debt deflation cycle, I think we would have huge money printing. I think we would battle it tooth and nail. The battle against deflation would be as ferocious, although the mirror image of the battle against inflation that Paul Volcker waged. Uh, so a, a related theme in the questions is sort of, does the Fed have the power to keep rates well below inflation? Well, of course they do. That's what they're doing right now. Um, uh, are the bond vigilantes helpless against the Fed? Yes, if the Fed is willing to buy infinite amounts of bonds at a price fixed level. And Jay Powell has historically, several months ago, made the statement that there is no limit to the Fed's ability to do QE. So we're in a manipulated situation. Uh, the, the, the motivations and the manner are the opposite of where things were uh, under Jimmy Carter. But the extreme nature of many of the things we've looked at today uh, are reminiscent and we're, uh, of, of those eras. So someone asked, has the Fed missed the window for raising rates? You know, a related question is, has the, you know, what, what's the stuff about the Fed claiming the economy is so strong? And then uh, five minutes later, uh, the Fed chairman says, um, but uh, we can't really uh, address the deficit until the, the economy is strong enough. Well, which is, is the economy really strong or what's the deal? Is the economy too strong to address the deficit? Is, is it not strong enough? Then why are you making all these statements about how strong the economy is? Uh, the the, the Fed, Fed can't address the deficit, it seems. Ever. If, if the economy is really weak, they say it's too weak. Now the economy is reported as being very strong. Nominal GDP, of course, is very strong, but apparently it's not strong enough to address the deficit. So it will never be strong enough to address the deficit. And the Fed, uh, I think, si similar to the inflation situation, 
I mean, if the, if the, if the, if the economy is so strong, why do we have all of this stimulus? It's because the economy is not strong. It's, it has the appearance of being strong because the strength comes from the stimulus, which has never been uh, as extreme as it is right now in our time. So with that, I'm going to wrap up my last webcast of the year. Thank you for your support. We're glad we've had a good year and been right on many aspects of the market. Never always right, of course, about 30% wrong. I think that's been about the hit rate this year. Good luck with the remainder of 2021. Enjoy the holiday season. Thank you for your support of Double Line, and goodbye for now.